Nehemiah chapter 6, verse number 1. Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand, which wherein was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Father, thank you for another opportunity here to open up your word. Please bless the service tonight. and pray that your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, be honored and glorified. Lord, every, uh, every person here, no doubt, maybe has some uh, different need, Lord, that only you know about. And I pray that you would meet that and give us the help that we need. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. So Nehemiah came, left Shushan to come build, rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, to rebuild the city. And all, along the way, he's gotten opposition, uh, mainly from Tobiah, from Sanballat, from Geshem, and from the rest of the enemies. And uh, they, they tried mocking. That didn't work. They tried outright violence. That didn't work. Nehemiah chapter 5, they took a break because the opposition was coming from within. But once that gets squared away, once that gets taken care of, here comes the enemies again. And uh, you just never get away from opposition. You just never get away from fighting. If it doesn't come from one instance, if it doesn't come from one direction, it's going to come from another. And the day you get tired of fighting and the day you give up on fighting is the day you're going to go down. Because the enemy is never going to stop. They're never going to stop. And he says in uh, chapter 6, verse 1, Now it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono, but they thought to do me mischief. So if one tactic doesn't work, they'll try another. If outright mocking, if outright violence doesn't work, they'll try guile, they'll try deceit, but they're, they're never going to stop trying. And that's, that's the lesson you need to really grasp, is that the enemy is never going to quit. And have you, if you have gotten victory over a certain sin or of a certain fault in the past, well, praise the Lord for it, but that victory is not sealed unto the day of redemption. <laughs> Your soul is sealed unto the day of redemption. That can't change. But the victory, the ground that the Lord's given you, that's up for grabs. Every day it's up for grabs. And if you don't fight for it, the enemy's going to get it because the enemy's going to keep fighting. And just because you've had victory for a month or six months or a year doesn't mean that that enemy is not going to rise up and try to regain that, that territory that it lost because it absolutely will. Uh, hold your finger here and go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. You have to keep watching and keep praying and keep fighting and keep going. Luke chapter 4, verse number 1. The Bible says, And Jesus, 
being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. So we're, we're reading about the end of the 40 days, but Jesus was tempted for 40 days of the devil. We're just reading about the grand finale. Um, verse number two, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So, 40 days Jesus has been tempted of the devil. Here at the end of it, he throws three more temptations. Look, if the devil's not going to say, I give up, you win to Jesus, you think he's going to give up on you? You think if you've had a measure of victory and you've had a measure of success, he's going to say, well, he's too much for me. He's too strong for me. I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave him alone. No, if the devil went after Jesus like that, then rest assured he hasn't given up on taking you down. And he says in verse number 13, And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. You know what that means? That means he's coming back. He departs for a season. That means he will be back. Now, in, in the scripture only gives us uh, this time of temptation by, by the devil. But if he departed for a season, that means he came back. The Lord just saw fit not to record the later circumstances. But he obviously did come back and try to get the Lord. Now, praise the Lord, the Lord won every single one of those. Aren't you glad that Jesus never gave in one time to one temptation? Aren't you glad he was tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin? Without that victory, we'd have, we'd have no salvation. But here's what, I wanna, here's what I want you to see. The devil is relentless. The enemy is relentless. They keep coming and keep coming and keep coming and they don't stop. And if they, if they thought that Jesus, if they thought there was a chance that Jesus could fall, I guarantee that the devil's looking at you and he doesn't think you're as strong as maybe you think you are. I'm as strong as maybe I think I am. I think he looks at you. I think he looks at me and says, there's someone I can take down. Now go back to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 6. So you're always going to have to fight. The enemy never stops. The attacks never stop. They take different forms. They take different uh, tactics. But it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't ever stop. It doesn't ever stop. And so you can't stop either. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse number 2. It says, Then uh, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, uh, Come, let us meet together, and some one of the villages of the plain of Ono. So when the mocking didn't work and the outright violence and opposition didn't work, now what they, now, you know what they resort to now. Well, why don't you stop doing what you're doing and come hang out with us? The temptation is to stop serving God and come meet with us. It, look, it wasn't important where they met. See, it says, come let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. In other words, it was a non-specific destination. The point was not where they wanted Nehemiah to go or where they wanted him to meet. The point was they wanted him to leave the wall that he was working on. And the devil doesn't care what you do as long as it's not serving God. He doesn't care. It doesn't have to be some big sin. As long as you're not working, as long as you're not doing something for God, he's okay with it. And so there's no great sin in going to meet in the plain of Ono, right? There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing greatly, overtly wrong about that except what's not happening. The work's not getting done. The wall's not being built. 
And folks, here's the temptation that you and I, we're going to face constantly throughout our life, is the, the, the draw, the temptation by the world, maybe by family, maybe by friends, is to, is to get you, maybe not into some great sin, but maybe just not being so dedicated to the work of God. And that's the temptation that they throw at Nehemiah that, hey, why don't, why don't you just stop working? Why don't you just come hang out with us and meet us? It doesn't have to be a great sin or a great error. It's just, are you, are you doing something for God or are you accomplishing nothing? And uh, there's nothing wrong with entertainment, to, depending on what it is. There's nothing wrong with entertainment to a degree. There's nothing wrong with get-togethers and fellowships and outings and all that to a degree. But while you're doing all that, you're, you know what's not happening? You're not studying your Bible and you're not praying and you're not witnessing. And if all you do is get together and have fun, well, some of that's okay. But what, what, is, what are you not doing? Nothing's, been, nothing's being accomplished for God. I'll show you. I'll show you this thing. Go, hold your finger here. Go to Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. Now, if you're married, then you're going to have you're going to have to balance this a little bit more than someone who's not married. First Corinthians 7 talks about that. If you're married, you're going to have to care for the things of the world, how you may please your wife, how you may please your husband. But Proverbs chapter 18. Verse number one, it says, Through desire, a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. If you want all the wisdom that God has to offer you in his book, you want everything that he you want to learn everything that he wants to teach you, all the wisdom, all the knowledge that he wants to give you, it's going to require you to separate yourself from some things. It may not even be, it may not be sinful, it may not be wrong, it's just taking up your time that could have been spent doing something for God. If you are, if you are going to accomplish anything for the Lord in this life, it will require separating yourself from some things you like to do. Maybe some hobbies, maybe some activities, maybe you're going to have to cut them out, or maybe you're going to have to cut them way back, but if you want all the wisdom that God has to offer you, it's go it requires work and it requires time, and you are going to have to separate yourself from other things that will take away your time and take away your energy. And that's just the truth of the matter. Now, go over one book to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse number 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, that would be Solomon. What is he crying out against? Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. You know what Ecclesiastes is, 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 a, is about? Crying against the vanity of living your life without serving God, without eternity in mind. It's not all sin. It's not all bad. It's not all wrong. It's just vain. It means absolutely nothing for eternity or for souls or for anything that matters. That's what he's crying out against. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Look at chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Look at verse number 1. I said in mine heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. See that? Pleasure. Well, some of it is okay, but what is it? It's vanity. It's empty. It doesn't, it doesn't contribute anything to the work of God. Verse 2, I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? 
I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting, uh, acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to, <clears throat> to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kind of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold. Anything we've read about so far sinful or wrong? No, there's nothing wrong with houses. There's nothing wrong with pools and servants and silver. And nothing wrong with that. It's not, it's not sinful. It's not wrong. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Now Solomon's richer probably than any of us will ever be. He accomplished more, at least in the physical sense of his earnings and his possessions than any of us will ever accomplish. So he's been there, done that. So why don't you listen to what he had to say about it? Because he's done it better and more <laughs> than you and I have done it. Well, verse 11, Then I looked on all the works of the, that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit unto the sun. If all, if, if what your time and energy and love and devotion to is anything but the service of God and laboring for the Lord, eventually give it enough time and you will come to this same conclusion. It was vanity. It was vexation of spirit. It profited me nothing. It didn't help my relationship with God. It didn't profit me at the judgment seat of Christ. It wasn't all wrong. It wasn't all sinful. But it wasted my time. If you do it long enough, it wastes your life. Now, is it wrong to... Go out and enjoy yourself in a clean manner sometimes? No. But what's the emphasis of your life? Is that what you live for? Is that what you love? Is that what you look forward to? Or is it serving God? And that, that's what he's getting at. He's preaching against vanity, about living your life, doing things not necessarily wrong, but that are worth nothing. So when you get to the end of your days and you look back on your life, you don't think, what have I done with my life? What have I done with the salvation that God gave me? You don't want to look back on your life and say, well, pretty much I lived it for myself. You don't want to say, well, at least it is, look, it's better than going all out into sin, but you don't want to get to the end of your life and realize, you know what, I really just lived my life for myself. Maybe I didn't do a whole lot wrong as we would classify it, but it was pretty much all about me. And that's not, that's, not, that's not how you want to live your life. That's not, one, that's not what you want to look back. You want to look back and say, you know what? From the day the Lord saved me, it wasn't always 100% as I should, but I, I gave my life to the Lord. I tried to do something for Him. And that's, that's the goal. So go, go back to Nehemiah. You know, a lot of Christians' lives, they're just filled with junk, just filled with... TV and social media and just time wasters, time wasters. I, one of these days I'm going to preach a sermon on that, preach a sermon on TV and social media and group it all together. But it's just, it's just a time waster. The, okay, so you spend two, three hours watching TV. Let's pretend, let's just pretend that everything you saw was clean and holy and righteous. Okay, let's just pretend that for a second. Well, but how much time did you waste looking at that? What could, what could you have been doing other than that? Ephesians 5 says we're supposed to redeem the time because the days are evil. Redeem it. Look at, look at go back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 6 says in verse number 2, 
that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one uh, of the villages in the plain of Ono. And a preacher one time said, Next time the world says, Why don't you come to the plain of Ono? You just tell them, Oh no. Oh no. Can't go there. Can't do that. Not leaving the work to go there. So then it says, But they thought to do me mischief. Look, if you think the Lord and His commandments and His way of living, if you, think, if you think the Lord is out to ruin your life, but the world is your friend, you need to wake up out of that fake reality. It's not true. And the world will only, they only, they only love you as you're worth something to them. But the moment you die, this world is going to keep rolling on like it always has. And there's not going to be much of a difference. But the Lord will give you everlasting life. The Lord will take you home to heaven to be with Him. He's the one that's on your side. He's the one that really loves you, not this world. It says, but they thought to do me mischief. Verse number three says, and I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work. I am doing a great work. Now, he's not being prideful. He, he didn't say, I'm a great worker. He said, I'm doing a great work. The work is what's great. If it's for God, it's, it's a great work. We here today. What we're trying to do, Victory Bible Baptist Church, we are doing a great work. Now, that doesn't mean we're doing, we're doing the best. That doesn't mean we're knocking it out of the park and all that. No, the work that we are involved in is a great work. The work of saving souls, building up Christians, having church, that is a great work. The work is great. He said, I'm doing a great work. I don't have time to come out and hang out with you. And again, so you're, you're going to be busy. You're going to do something for God. You're going to have to say, no, I don't have time for that. Well, why? What's wrong with it? Well, maybe nothing, but I've got better things to do. I've got more important things to do. I've got things that actually matter that I need to be doing. I don't have time to come do that. And you're going to have to say that. Verse number three says, and I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Any step away from the work of God is a step down. Whatever you want to say, well, this is what I do, this is what I'm involved in, well, what's wrong with it? Well, maybe nothing, but it's a step down from serving God. It's a step down from doing something for the Lord. He said, I can't not come down. And he didn't say, I'm not going to come down. He said, I cannot, I cannot come down. It's not even a possibility for me to leave this work to come hang out with you. Now, folks, every one of us, we don't, we don't need to, you know, you know when we need to repent? Not after we've already fallen, not after we've already given into a temptation, when in our mind it's even a possibility that we want to fall or that we want to give into the temptation. You don't wait until you've already fallen to repent, to go to the Lord, to ask for help. You, the, moment, the moment in your mind it turns from, I cannot do that, to I don't think I want to do that, that's the moment you need to repent because now you've already opened the door in your mind. Now it's a possibility in your mind. And that's the time you need to repent. That's the time you need to get on your knees and say, Lord, help me, because I've already entertained it as a possibility. And Nehemiah says, I cannot come down. There is no chance, there is no possibility that I am coming down to hang out with you. I got work to do. I got work to do. Hold your finger here. Go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. People's problems are, if people get into trouble when, they, when they're serving God and doing right, but in their mind it's only one option out of many. Well, this is a good, this is a good life. This is, uh, I think I'll try it for a while, see how it turns out. But if it doesn't turn out how I want, if it doesn't really go my way, then I'm out. You're already in trouble if that's your attitude. If that's your mindset, you don't need to, you need to repent now. You don't need to wait till you fall to, to repent. You need to repent now that going the other way is even a possibility in your mind. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points 
tempted like as we are, yet without sin. See that? Jesus Christ was tempted in every point that you're tempted in, and I'm tempted in, but what did he not do? He never gave in to the temptation. Now look verse, verse, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When is your time of need? Not after you've already fallen, when you're tempted to fall. When the temptation arises, this is the temptation, this is what my flesh wants, this is what I want to go after. That's the time you need to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I need help. That's your time of need. It's not after you've already fallen and made a mess of it. Lord, I need mercy and grace now. Well, that's true, but you needed it before you fell. You needed it when the temptation came up and your heart wanted it. That's your time of need. That's when you go to the Lord and say, help me, Lord. So I don't go down this road instead of asking the Lord to pick you up after you've already gone down that road. Look at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. What the Lord's getting at here in these verses, to you that are serving God, not, not, to, not to people that aren't doing anything for God, they're not even on the discussion right now. To, to, to you that are doing something for God, to you that are serving God, how much would it take to really knock you off that course? How much trouble, how much trial, how much pushback, how much opposition would it take you to stop and to quit doing that? Right? Acts chapter 4, look at verse number, well, I'll start in verse 13, Acts 4, 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a noble miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. That's, it should be a pretty easy judgment call. Verse 20, For we... Watch this. We cannot, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. You know what Peter and John said? It's not that we don't, it's not that we won't stop talking about Jesus. It's not that we couldn't stop talking about Jesus. It's not that we wouldn't or we not planning on it. He said, we cannot, we cannot stop talking and teaching about Jesus Christ. Now, the question to you, the question to me, you that are speaking up for the Lord, you that are witnessing, could you stop? Would you stop? What would it take you to cause you to stop? Could you honestly say, I can't stop? talking about Jesus Christ. I can't stop this course. He's done so much for me. He's, he's loved, he loved me. He died for me. He gave me everlasting life. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what anyone says. I can't stop talking about Jesus Christ. See, there's a difference. There's a difference between someone who is doing it but could be persuaded otherwise and someone who says nothing, nothing, nothing can stop me. And Nehemiah says, I cannot come down to you. I'm doing a great work. I can't do that. Go back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Verse number three. He says, And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? <laughs> It'd be a step down to come down and hang out with you 
from, from, from doing the work that I'm doing, serving God. He said, why should the work cease? Well, that's been their goal the whole time. The, folks, the goal of the enemy is to cause the work to cease. Now, I said before, I'll say it again. They're only against you as, as, as long as you're serving God. If you stop serving God, they will stop opposing you. Because it's not about you, it's about the work. That's what their goal is. Their goal is to stop the work. Go back to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse number 11 says, And our adversaries said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. They're only opposing. They're only planning violence and murder so they can stop the work. The work is what's important, folks. Folks, you're, you and I, we are only significant to the enemy if we're doing something for God. Now, I didn't say you weren't significant to God. You are significant to the Lord. I said you're only significant to the enemy if you're doing something for God. The enemy doesn't care anything about you if you're not serving God. The only reason you attract attention is because you're doing something for God. The work is what's important. God knows that, and the enemy knows that. We need to know that. The work is what's important. The work is more important than the individual. How's that? Now, anyone who's been in the military understands that perfectly. Anyone who's been in the military understands the mission is more important than the individual mem member. And whatever has to happen for the mission to be completed, that's what has to happen. If some people lose their lives in the process, well, that's not what we wanted. It's very sad. But guess what? The mission must be accomplished. Now, that's a secular mission for, a, for men of the world, for their own purposes. How much more important, how much more serious is our work for God where we're laboring for eternal souls that are going to spend forever somewhere. I'm telling you, on the authority of the Word of God, the mission, the work, is more important than the individual. The opposition is about the work. Our lives should be about the work. I'll show it to you in the New Testament. Go to, hold your finger here. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Look, once the Lord saved you, He could have just taken you home. I mean, you're saved. Why leave you here? Well, because there's work to do. And I, I'm glad you're saved, but there's some other people that need to be saved too. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 25. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all, and was full of heaviness, because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him again ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Now why was he sick unto death? Well, verse 30. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Now that's a rebuke or a challenge, if you will, to every one of us. Do we take the work of Christ so seriously that it would hazard our health? Do we take the work of God so seriously that we would work so hard, we would go on so little sleep, we would put so much energy into it that it's actually made us sick unto death? That's Epaphroditus. He didn't catch a virus. He didn't catch a cold. He didn't catch... No, he was sick unto death because that's how hard he was working for God. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and say, you know, I, I, that's my example I'm setting. I'm not going to say that. I'm saying that's a challenge to every single one of us. That that's the importance of the work of Christ. That's how serious it is. If it was your loved one that you cared about, you would want somebody to work that hard if that's what it took to get them saved. Well, everybody out there, someone's loved one. And there's someone who the Lord died for. And there's someone who the Lord, who, Lord shed his blood for. 
And it's that important, folks. It really is. It's that important. Go back to Nehemiah. Here's, here's something else I want you to, to notice in, this, uh, in chapter 6. In prior chapters, the enemy opposed all the Jews working on the wall. They, they opposed everyone. They tried to oppose. They mocked all the Jews. They, they were going to try to slay all the Jews. In chapter 6, all the, all the opposition is focused on one man, and that's Nehemiah. And that's he's the leader. He, they, they have stopped opposing the whole, all the builders. They've, they've stopped opposing all the Jews. And they, they focus all their, comp, all their efforts on taking out Nehemiah. And folks, no member is more important than another member. We know that from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Every member of the body of Christ is important. Nobody functions alone. But you can't deny, you can't deny that when a leader falls, it, takes, it makes more of an impact and causes more trouble than when someone who just barely shows up on Sunday morning falls and goes back into the world. You can't deny that when someone in church leadership falls, it makes more of an impact. And they're focusing all their efforts on just Nehemiah in chapter 6. And so you want to you wanna be, if you are in church leadership, or maybe one day you want to be in church le leadership, you better learn that. Because, and, and you better prepare and you better be ready, because what you're doing is signing up for a target on your back. And that's why it's so important even to pray. That's why Paul, everywhere he went, he said, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Because you, you don't think the devil was more focused on Paul than somebody else? He absolutely was. And all these attacks are coming at Nehemiah in chapter 6. They said, you know what? Forget all the other Jews. Forget everybody else building the wall. If we can take out Nehemiah, we can cause this work to cease. He says in verse number 4, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse number 4. Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Four times. Hey, Nehemiah, why don't you come meet us in the plain of Ono? Nope, doing a great work. Can't come down to you. Okay. Hey, Nehemiah, you want to come meet us in the plain of Ono? Nope, doing a great work. Can't come down to you. Oh, okay. Hey, Nehemiah, four times. Four times. The, folks, the enemy is persistent. You need to be just as persistent. They do not give up. You can't give up. And they will keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. You say, well, I, I've, won that. I've won that battle before. You better win it again because it's coming back. And uh, folks, you know what the world's, you know what the devil's desire is? His desire is to wear you out. It's to wear you out, wear you down, break down your will. That's what he does. I'll show you that. Go to, let's hold your finger here. Go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Get Daniel 7 and Job 14. Daniel 7 and Job 14. The devil and the world, they are trying to wear you down. They are trying to break you down. You said no four times before. Well, they're going to come for a fifth time. They're going to keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. Daniel 7, verse number 25. Daniel 7, 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. Now, this is a prophecy about the Antichrist. We won't get into all the doctrinal content here, but what does he do? He, he wears out the saints of the Most High. You know what he does? How about today? How about today? How about today? What about this time? What about this time? What about this time? And he keeps coming, keeps coming. Hopefully, one of these times you'll say yes and, answer, and, and fall for the temptation. And here's, here's the things, you, here's, here's what you need to watch out for, folks. Here's what you need to watch out for. The first time the world offers you something and you say no and you mean it and you have no intention of doing it, praise the Lord. The next time they do it, if you still say no, are you still as firm? Are you still as solid? Do you still have no interest in it? Or has your heart started to go that way just a little bit? Well, if that's the case, then you're already in trouble because they're going to keep pushing and keep pushing and keep asking till they wear you down until you finally say yes. 
That's how the world operates. That's how the devil operates. Just wear you down, wear you out till you finally give in. And that's why it's so important every day, every day to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You, if, you, if you ever said it forcefully, no, then you need to say it that forcefully every single time. And if you catch, your say, if you catch yourself saying, no, 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 I shouldn't do that, you're in trouble. You're in trouble because they're, they're about to break you down. Look at Job, Job 14. Job 14, verse number 19. The waters wear the stones. The waters wear the stones. Thou washest away the things which grow out of the dust of the earth, and thou destroyest the hope of man. So, you picture a river, and you picture a stone in that river, and over time, what does it do? Just wears it out, wears it out, smooths it down, wears it out, wears it out. Now, waters in your Bible is a picture of, we won't turn there, Revelation 17, many places. Waters are a picture of multitudes, peoples, nations, and stones. If you're saved, you're a lively stone. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5. So what happens? Not only does the devil wear you out, but the world wears you out. And they keep coming, and they keep coming, and they keep coming. The waters wear the stones. In other words, you're trying to stand against the current if you're saved. You're, you're trying to go against the course of this world, and the course of this world just keeps flowing. It keeps flowing by you, keeps flowing o over you, in hopes that they will one day wear you down, and you won't take such a solid stand anymore. That's how the devil works. That's how the world works. You got to keep standing. You, you have to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I'll show it to you in, in a couple more passages. Go to Judges. Judges 14. I'm sure you're familiar with these, with, uh, with Samson. How was Samson taken down? Over and over and over and over again. Wait, can you tell me this time? Can you tell me this time? What about this time? What about this time? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you. Look at it in Judges 14. Judges 14, look at verse number 12. And Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you. If you can certainly declare it me within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you thirty sheets and thirty change of raiments. But if you cannot declare it me, then shall ye give me thirty sheets and thirty change of garments. And they said unto him, Put forth thy riddle that we may hear it. And he said unto them, Out of the eater, out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they could not in three days expound the riddle. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband, that he may declare unto us thy riddle, lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire. Well, nice folks, nice folks. Have ye called us to take the, uh, that we have? Is it not so? And Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost but hate me, and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people, and hast not told it me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father nor my mother, and shall I tell it thee? And she wept before him the seven days. That's a long time to hear your wife cry. <laughs> seven days of weeping while their feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her, because she lay sore upon him. And she told the riddle to the children of her people. Seven days, Samson, please tell me. Oh, Samson, you don't love me, you hate me. Seven days of that, and he finally gives in. Okay, okay, I'll tell you the riddle. And he doesn't learn. Look at chapter 16. The enemy says you're going to, the enemy sees you're going to fall for that. Well, why go away from it? Keep trying, right? Look at uh, chapter 16, verse number 4. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee every one of us eleven hundred pieces of silver. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. And Samson said unto her, If they bind me with seven green wists that were 
wine ever dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green wisps which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. And we, she, she just, he keeps telling her all these fake things, and she keeps trying it. And then, so skip, skip to verse 13. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me, and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web, and she tries that, and doesn't work. Verse, go, skip to verse uh, 15. And she said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee, when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass, when she pressed him daily with her words, and urged him, so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart, and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak, and be like any other man. And you know the rest of the account. They, they bind him, they put out his eyes, he's afflicted, and... He's no, he's no more doing exploits till the day of his death. But what happened? Over, first time, not telling you. Second time, not telling you. Third time, not telling you. Fourth time, not telling you. Day after day after day, please, please, you don't love me. Okay, I give in. Folks, that's how the devil works. That's how the world works. They will keep asking. They are trying to wear you down. Hey, you want to hey, you want to do this? You want to do that? No. No, 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 not doing that, not going there. No, I'm standing right here. You got to be firm, firm, firm every single day. Cuz they just they don't you don't have to say yes for them to win. You just have to say no a little less strongly. That's all they're looking for. And eventually, eventually they know that you're going to wear you're going to wear out and give in and break down. And you have to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And you have to stand, having done all to stand. It doesn't matter how many times they come at you. You've got to stand strong. You've got to stand strong. So go back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 5. So they, four times, hey, Nehemiah, you want to you come join us in the plain of Ono? Four times. And then verse number 5 it says, Nehemiah 6, 5, Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. So this is the fifth time, but this time they've got an open letter in his hand, which means probably a lot of people have seen it. It's an intimidation method. It's not secret. Verse 6, Wherein was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it. And that's supposed to, you know, that's supposed to be, Oh, wow, Gashmu, he's really important. Well, he, pre he pretty, you know, he obviously was an important person uh, 4,500 years ago, but who, who knows who he is now? And whoever you think is important, whoever you think the big shot is today, eventually nobody will know, know who they are. Nobody will remember him. What's going to last? The Word of God's going to last. The work you've done for the Lord's going to last. The people that you think are big, important in, in this world, they're not going to last. Who's Gashmu? Who even knows who Gashmu is? Well, apparently he was an important person, but... I've never met anyone who knows who he is. But he says, it is reported among the heathen. And I said it before, I'm going to keep saying it. Stop paying so much attention to what's reported among the heathen. Who cares what's reported among the heathen? We got work to do for God. That's what they're going to come at you with. You know, you know what the heathen are reporting, right? You know what Gashmu says, right? Yeah, and I got work to do for God. It says, it is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel. For which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. How's that? You, you, you still liking? It's a, great, it's a great book on leadership, Nehemiah. So here's, here's another lesson about leadership. Here's a, here's a lesson that you need to make sure you have down pat before you sign up for it. People are going to lie about you. They're just going to make stuff up because that's what they do. If you can't handle that, then don't get in leadership. It's going to happen. He says, "What well, they said, you're going to be the king. That's what, that's, what, that's what we've heard. Verse 7, And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee. 
Oh, here's Nehemiah, the great king. Praise Nehemiah. And also, also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. And now shall it be reported to the king according to these words, Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. In other words, you want to meet with us now? Look what's going to happen. Look what's going to be reported to the king. Intimidation method. Intimidation method. Verse number 8. Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. That's simple. That's simple. Yeah, you made it up. It's, it's not going to, doesn't matter. I'm not listening. And that's all the time that you need to take with that. That's all the time you need to uh, spend on that kind of thing. You just say, nope, not true, and then keep going. Any more time you spend on it than that, you're just wasting your time. You're just wasting your time. You're just wasting your time. And uh, uh, he says, Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. Verse number 9 says, For they all made us afraid, saying, Thy hand, Their hand shall be weakened from the work. See, it's always been about the work. Their hand shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now, what came of their accusations? Nothing. Here's, here's the lesson. They said, oh, this is going to be reported to the king. He's going to put a stop to it. You need to come meet with us. Nehemiah said, you made it up. I didn't say that. And he gets on with his business. And then nothing more. You don't read anything more of it. It came to absolutely nothing. So here's the lesson. Accusations are always going to come against you if you try to do something for God. But live your life in a way where it doesn't stick. In other words, you live your life... According to God, you live your life holy, righteous, above board, so that when people do make accusations, the vast majority of people say, no, he didn't say that. He didn't do that. That's not him. You can't stop the accusations from coming, but you can live your life in a way where it doesn't gain any traction. And nobody was buying this about Nehemiah. The king wasn't buying it. Nobody, in, nobody that mattered bought it. And they said, you know, Nehemiah, he's appointed prophets to preach of him. He's made himself a king. He's going to rebel. It never went anywhere. The only thing, the only people that said that were people that didn't like what was going on. It didn't come to anything. And you just live your life for God. Accusations are going to come, but you live your life in a way where pe the majority of people say, that's not true. He didn't do that. He didn't say that. And that's what you do. He says in verse 9, for they all made us afraid. The joy of the Lord is your strength. We'll get to that in chapter 8. So they're trying to make you afraid to, to, to break you down, to make you weak. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Here's another prayer of Nehemiah. You know what Nehemiah does? He goes to God. God, you need, you, I, you, I need your help. I need your strength. I can't handle this on my own. Every time Nehemiah comes up against opposition, he never spends much time with the opposition. He always brings it to God. Look at chapter 4. Look at chapter 4, verse number 3. Chapter 4, verse number 3. Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. What does Nehemiah say? Hear, O our God! For we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. You know, when, when they mocked, you know what Nehemiah did? He took it to God. Look, verse number 8. And conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God. When they, when they tried mocking, he took it to God. When they tried violence, he took it to God. Here in chapter 6, they try another tactic. What does he do? He takes it to God. And folks, if God doesn't hold you up, then you're not going to be held up. And if God doesn't give you strength, then you don't have any. And you, you need to spend less time with the, accuse, with the people that accuse you, less time with the people that are just trying to cause you trouble, and more time talking to God. Instead of spending so much time trying to defend yourself, trying to say that's not true, and going around fix, trying to fix all the problems, if you spent that time in prayer to God, that'd be a much, much better use of your time. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah says, I didn't do that, you made that up, and then he goes to God. 
That's, you don't need to spend any more time than that. That's not true. It didn't happen. And then get on with your work. Get on to God. And he's the help. Vain. Vain is the help of man. We, we need God on our side. If God's be, look, if God be for us, who can be against us, right? But if God's not on your side, it doesn't matter if everyone else is for you. You're not, you're not going anywhere. You're not doing anything. You need God's help. You need God's power and God's strength. No matter what you do, you live for God. Live for God, trust the Lord, and do something for Him. Do something for Him with this life. Is everything in your life, or in, people, in many people's lives, is everything sinful? No. Is it all wrong? No. But what are you doing for God? You know what Nehemiah is about? Nehemiah is about a man who did something for God. He did something that mattered. The challenge to every one of us, what are we doing with our life? If all you can say is, I'm not involved in any bad sin, that's not really a high mark. What are you accomplishing? What are you doing for God? It doesn't have to be great in man's eyes. Yeah, I mean, we're not talking about success as the world views it. Tr live to impress God. Live to impress God. He's the one you're going to stand before.